Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all. Uh, let's have a prayer, and we'll go ahead and get started. Heavenly Father, we're glad to be together. Uh, you know, it's one of the best things about being a Christian is having the opportunity to come together and to share and to learn uh, together. And we say this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the last time I talked, about a month ago, uh, we talked about 1 Corinthians 12. And kind of the backstory there was um, a, a while ago, I did a study into the different chapters that Ellen White recommends to memorize. And uh, two of the chapters are 1 Corinthians 12 and 13. And uh, I think it's part of a, a larger spiritual thought of chapters 12, 13, and 14 on spiritual gifts and the work that the Holy Spirit is doing. So I, I kind of want to do all three of them, so next time I'll do chapter 14. But I have to say, I'm a little nervous about talking about chapter 13. And I'll tell you why, because, because I'm not married, right? So like I'm, I'm not the expert, or maybe I am the expert. Maybe I'm like that backseat driver, right, who's here to tell you, like, turn left, hit the brakes, you know? It's like, uh, it's like uh, those people without kids who just, you know, they're the experts, right? So... So I don't want to be that guy. <laughs> I want to be that guy this morning. Uh, so I want to take a different, different angle on 1 Corinthians 13 that hopefully uh, will be beneficial today. Uh, and uh, to understand, I think, what's really happening in 1 Corinthians 13, <clears throat> let's pick back up at the end of 1 Corinthians 12 to get a running head start into 1 Corinthians 13. So if you turn with me to 1 Corinthians 12, we're going to start in verse 27 and read the last few verses to understand Paul's lead into 1 Corinthians 13. <clears throat> so 1 Corinthians 12, starting in verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually, and God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps administrations, varieties of tongues. And we have a series of just uh, questions that are not, aren't really supposed to be answered. Are all apostles? Of course not. Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gifts. And yet I show you a more excellent way. And then here we are into 1 Corinthians 13. So uh, just to kind of wrap up and summarize what we have going here is that God has given spiritual gifts to the church, of course. And we work together as the body, and we spent some time talking about that last time. We're working together. We all have different gifts, different ministries. We're different people. That's good. Uh, there are some gifts that are more important than others, which is kind of interesting. You might think that if God's giving spiritual gifts that they're all the same, but some have a higher impact than others. <clears throat> And it's even recommended to us to really want to have the best gifts, to have like the biggest ministry. However, even with these great gifts, there's something else that we need to keep in mind. And then here we go on from here. And what I want to propose to you is that 1 Corinthians 13, while we think about it as the love chapter, it's really the continued exposition on spiritual gifts. That's what Paul is presenting on, and that's his grand thought that's continuing from 1 Corinthians 12 through 1 Corinthians 14. So we can think about this through that lens as we get started. So verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. <clears throat> so Paul starts by saying that even if he has the gift of tongues, which I, you know, I, I don't know, sometimes I imagine, like, if you could choose a superpower, you know, it's that, like, superpower thing. If you could choose a, a superpower, what superpower do you want? I mean, like super strength, that's pretty handy. Being able to fly, that is pretty handy. But I think that if I could choose a superpower, I would like to have the ability to speak any language and understand any language. I think that would just be so useful because uh, I'm not a really big traveler. One of the barriers for me is I'm like, man, if I go to some other country I, and I don't understand, <laughs> I'm like, how am I going to enjoy myself? To me, that's a little like overwhelming. I know a little bit of Spanish, just enough to get myself into trouble so that people think that I can speak Spanish, and, I, and they start talking to me, and I'm like, whoa, <laughs> I just get myself into trouble. I also want to point out that Paul knows what it's like to speak in the tongues of angels. 
in that heavenly language. So in, if you jump to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 4, Paul describes to us that this heavenly language is so far to, out of our experience that it's, he says it's not lawful to talk about. Um, so even something that amazing, if it doesn't come from a place of love, has no practical value. Even these gifts that really have a wide usefulness, if they don't come from a place of love, don't have a practical value. Uh, so what is this love that he's talking about? So the purpose of spiritual gifts is to be a witness to others, both inside and outside of the church. However, if it doesn't come from a place of love, a true desire to bless someone else, rather than to bless ourselves, it's a counterproductive endeavor. Which is interesting to think about. After Paul has spent all this time building up these spiritual gifts. So verse 2 now. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. So here we have three spiritual gifts. We have prophecy, which we're very familiar with. We have knowledge, and then we have faith. So prophecy is one of the most important spiritual gifts. Uh, just a few verses earlier, Paul had said that it ranks number two on his like BuzzFeed top 10 list. You won't, number two will surprise you. Uh, list of spiritual gifts. Um, <clears throat> but even without love there, it uh, is lacking. So wisdom and knowledge are the foundation of religion. If we don't have wisdom and we don't have knowledge of spiritual things, I mean, what are we doing? We're just sitting around sharing our opinion. There's nothing really to base it on. Uh, and faith is vital to our Christian experience and ministry. So as exalted as these gifts are, if we don't have love, it's as if we're not doing anything. Our ministry really isn't worth anything at all. We're nothing. Think about it this way. I, I think back to King Saul. Uh, there was a time when he was going after David, uh, and he ended up, God tripped him up by causing him to prophesy, and it was so out of character to him that people turned it into a joke, and they're like, man, is Saul also one of the prophets? It really didn't have no practical impact to the people that were hearing it. They're just like, this is not what this guy is about. And ultimately, even if we have something so special, if we don't have the love and the ministry for the other people, it'll just be like, yeah, that's nice, I guess, but these people really don't care. So let's go to verse 3. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not love, it profits me nothing. So let's say that your personal ministry is so impactful that you want to go all in and sell all your stuff so that you can use the money to extend your, uh, your, your ministry even further. Without love, you're not going to receive any practical spiritual benefit out of that. And if you're so committed that you're willing to be burned for your faith, you know, uh, which was a reality for the times that they were writing these thin, things in, but if you're doing it without the love for others, I mean, maybe you're just stubborn. <laughs> maybe you're just stubborn. Uh, you might be surprised on resurrection morning. You know, some people give things out of their pride. Uh, they want to be seen as giving. They want to be seen as, uh, um, as uh, being, uh, the word I'm looking for, I'm going to say liberal, but that has connotations that, that aren't necessarily so positive sometimes. But there's just giving back to that. Um, some people give so that they can have their names on buildings. That doesn't really seem particularly to match up with Christian virtues to me. So if we give with our motivations being for personal gain rather than to selflessly benefit others, we'll be surprised when the law of heavens don't, don't play along with our expectations. So now that we've established that ministry needs love as a foundation for it to have any value, let's talk about what love is. And I see the next three verses as more of a description of what love is, not necessarily a definition. So... Sometimes things are descriptions, not definitions. So if I were to say, like, the house is white, that's not a definition of the house, right? That's a description of the house. A house is a place where people live, and it's a, it's a building, right? That's it. So, like, I, a, a similar thought is in um, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, uh, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. To me, that's a description of what faith is, whereas, like, a definition would be verse 6. You know, without faith, it is impossible to please God, for you must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those that diligently, diligently seek. And that's more of a definition in my mind. Maybe that <laughs> is neither here nor there, but let's talk about a description of what love is. So uh, we'll take this sort of like nugget by nugget as we're going through this passage here that, uh, and these verses can stand on their own right. 
you know. But like I said, I'm not here to lecture you on, on what love is, the single unmarried guy. So love suffers long and is kind. So the love that works for others is not short term. Because I'm sure this isn't a surprise to you, but as people in their journey to the Lord, uh, it doesn't always happen quick or instantaneous, right? Sometimes people's journey to the Lord, it takes years. You know, it could be a, t- a long struggle to overcome alcoholism. You know, stuff like that doesn't happen overnight. Um, sometimes it takes years of contact, you know, years of getting over an addiction, years of praying that someone will come home. And uh, the, the love for, that works for others is also kind. So it's willing to help even if it's inconvenient. And one of the things that came to my mind as I was thinking about kindness is that it, it doesn't prioritize personal or political views over the importance of, of making a connection. And it's always been a little, it's been disconcerting to me how often when I'm in church, I hear people just like sharing their political views or whatever, just like kind of openly. And in a way that's like pejorative and talking down about other people and other groups of people, I don't want to risk, you know, someone's perception of God and my church. That's not more important. That's not more. That's not less important than my particular views on, on politics. And I've just, you know, even here in this church, I've just heard people talking about politics and views and whatever in ways that make me uncomfortable. And I just want to say, like, that's not more important than other people's salvations. Like, we have other ways and times to talk about these things. But here in a way that has the potential, just the way that I've heard people talk about other people in politics, it really has the potential to turn people off from even coming back here altogether. And I think that's something to think about. So to the next nugget now. Love does not envy. So the love that works for others isn't envious of others who are more successful in ministry. Uh, so like I said last time, I, um, back in 2005, 6, 7, I went to a small evangelism school and then did about a couple years of Bible work um, out in Portland and then a year down in Florida. And I wasn't a particularly good or successful Bible worker. I have friends that, I mean, like, that are just so good, you know, that just like baptized like dozens of people. And in all that time, I never had anyone that I baptized. And the only person that I was able, ever able to take back, you know, all the way through, through baptism was when I finished Bible work and I went back to Bowling Green State University and I was, you know, I had a friend that um, I invited to a series of meetings and then she came into the church that way. And so, you know, it was very easy to just compare myself like, man, I am such a failure. <laughs> <laughs> and to be envious of people that have more of that certain type of connection and ability. But we all have different roles to play, and it looks different ways. Um, uh, so we have to be careful about this desire and this envy of other people and what it seems like is this influence in ministry. So it doesn't uh, envy any perceived prestige or power or influence that would be the result of a ministry. And it doesn't cause divisions uh, to form as a result of even passive aggressive power moves as you envy possibly someone's role within the church. Uh, let's see. So the next couple, love does not parade itself, is not puffed up. The love that works for others isn't excited for the success of ministry for the sake of being successful. It doesn't parade itself as some special teacher or a ministry person to the people that are being worked with. Uh, it doesn't come with a sense of entitlement for church roles or responsibilities like well you know i've done all this of course i should have some type of you know church role or something like that i mean in the end i mean what is a role i mean in a church setting it should be recognizing you for things that you're already doing i mean like i'm an elder but that doesn't really particularly matter to me (laughs) no one asked me if i wanted to be well i guess they did in the nominee committee but i didn't ask for it If I wasn't an elder, I would still be doing the same things. You know, the role isn't that important. We should be following Jesus and doing what he asks us to do, regardless of whatever the role is. Does not rejoice in iniquity. Let's see. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. The love that works for others doesn't base its treatment of others on race, age, 
class or other social conventions. It doesn't assume its own importance and talk over others. It doesn't look down on the religious experience and background of others. Sometimes I hear this in Sabbath school, well, this other religion, you know, they're just not good people or whatever. That's not really what we're after. We're bringing people to a place of more truth and a closeness to Christ. And I think we have to be careful sometimes about how we speak about other people and other religious groups. We don't want to talk down to them, but we want to be forward-facing and taking people into a closer walk with Christ, I think. <clears throat> Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. The love that works for others would rather rejoice in things that are true, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. The love that works for others bears setbacks by the grace of God. It focuses on the promises that God has given and claims them as compass-setting truths. It always hopes for the best outcomes when working with others, even if the odds seem long. The love that works for others, that endures all things, sometimes called the patience of the saints. So love matters and is important. Spiritual gifts matter, and they're important too. So why is it that throughout this chapter, Paul is really elevating love? I mean, all these things are important. All these things have a place. All these things have a role. So why is Paul saying that this love that is outward focused is so important? And then he goes on the next few verses to explain this. And this is why I think that this chapter really is a grand exposition on spiritual gifts. So let's, uh, I think we're in 11 and 8, 8 through 10. Yeah. <clears throat> love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away. So Paul, to summarize, at the end of the day, love as a virtue and as a person extends forever. Well, the spiritual gifts that we have are, are really temporary. They're to get us to a certain place. When we get to heaven, we're not going to need the spiritual gifts. For instance, uh, let's see. The point of prophecies is so that we can see things in the world and have them establish our faith deeper in God and in the Bibles and have an understanding of like the times that we're living in. And also prophecy points out to us personal areas that we need to grow more in. At a certain point, we're no longer going to need the gift of prophecy because we can speak face to face with God and the angels and we'll have a greater clarity that way. We won't need prophecy anymore. <clears throat> uh, Although I will say it'll be very interesting, you know, when we get to heaven to be able to take the Bible and go back and really like match things up with, with history and get, a, get that like bird's eye view of what's really been happening and going on. Uh, let's see. Also, when we get to heaven, we're no longer going to need the gift of tongues because we're all going to be speaking one language. So the gift of tongues practically isn't going to have a use. The knowledge that we have of spiritual things when we get to heaven, it's going to seem pretty insignificant when we can have the opportunity to speak with God and the angels, and we can go really and talk directly to the prophets and the people that we read about. And we're going to find out so much more that the little that we know will see like, man, you know, it's kind of cute that we thought that back when we were on earth, but we know so much more now. Verses 11 and 12. <clears throat> when I was a child, I spake as a child. Uh, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know, just as also I am known. So the things that we talk about now, even to the best of our ability, will be eclipsed by what we will be exposed to in heaven. Even now when we talk about heaven, I mean, do we even really know what we're talking about? I mean, we have a description, there's like a tree of life there, and... The New Jerusalem's there. We really don't even know what that looks like. Apparently, it's as wide as it's tall, but what does that mean? You know, what does it really look like? <clears throat> we're gonna, we have so much more to find out in the reality of where we're going. It's a lot to look forward to. We see through, we just have a dim view of what we're looking forward to. That ability to meet with the Father in his glory, to commune with the Son, and to converse with the Holy Spirit are really some of our top motivators for wanting to be there when we get to heaven, to be able to find out and to know these things and to take the understanding that we have and move it to such a deeper level. So then as we're coming in to, to land the airplane here in verse 13, 
And now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. So speaking of, of things that motivate us, I mean, these three are the three great motivators. Uh, let's see. How could we connect with God without faith? How could we live without hope? I mean, could not practically move on with life and keep going without hope. And how could we desire without love? Why would we want to, to do anything? So why is love the greatest? It's because that's what God identifies himself with the most. For example, in uh, 1 John 4.16, And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. That's what God wants us to have as our core motivation. When we think about spiritual gifts and the work that we're doing for others, we always have to keep this connection with God as the central, prime, motivating influence. Because some, it's very easy for us as human beings to, I mean, pride is like a natural part of our, our human nature. We don't even really think about it. And that's what makes it one of the most dangerous things, right? Because it's so easy for us to have blind spots, uh, you know, because pride doesn't really see that it has a, a need or a need to change or anything. And this is why we need to stay connected with God so he can point out our need to be with him. He can point out our blind spots and our need for love so that when we do work for others, we don't, and God empowers us to do that work, we don't get caught up in the work itself. Like, wow, you know, God's working for me. You know, I think of Peter, you know, he's out walking on the water and I think he had that experience, right? It's like, wow, God's empowered. I'm walking on the water. And he goes down. And God had to come and pull him out. And that's what Jesus does for us. <clears throat> we always have to have that connection. So as we end here, I want to leave you with the first verse of 1 Corinthians 14. So pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. And we'll pick up there next time. So let's have a prayer and we'll wrap up. So Heavenly Father, you want us as a church, as we learned in 1 Corinthians 12, that you want us to work as a body. And we all have different roles, and it's okay to have different roles. And as we think about the spiritual gifts and the ministries that you want to take us into, we ask that you would put love in our hearts. Because without love and that desire to work for the benefit of others, regardless of how it impacts us and our ministry, really our our work is nothing. It's a loud clinging symbol, just a loud annoying noise. And uh, we'll be surprised when, Lord, we worked for you. And, you know, and he's like, well, I didn't know you. <clears throat> so we ask that you would give us this love, work on our hearts, and help us to be able to be an effective body of believers working together with you. And we say this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we spit up for the Sabbath school classes, we have the sanctuary class. We've got a Sabbath school class over there in uh, that mother's room. We've got one down in the library. We've got one down the hall in Pastor Robot's office. The young adults are down the hall in the fellowship hall. Have a great Sabbath. No? I know it's on. Okay, can you hear me now? No? Um, I, it was working. It's on. Why do you station?
<laughs> okay, that works. All right, perfect. All right, let me move it down a little bit. I really thought you couldn't hear me. How is everybody? It's freezing outside. It was 23 degrees. Plus, it's windy. So it's cold outside. <laughs> but anyway, as he walked in this morning, where is Joe? Joe Schaefer. He's at the door. He's greeting. Oh, he's greeting. Okay. Well, we walked in, Brian and I walked in this morning, and Joe said, I think you guys need to uh, have your membership renewed at this church. <laughs> You've been gone so much. <laughs> I almost felt bad, but he likes to kid people, so anyway. But uh, how's been, how have you guys been? Anything going on in our family, church family? Request for prayer? Thanksgivings? Get Dr. Small. share the goal. We want Centerville Church to be the, the church of choice for everybody within driving range. And the, the concept that th there are obstacles, there are things that have to be overcome. And, and to me, I think part of the message has been the obstacles God's going to take care of. All, all I have to do is to be willing to witness for Him and I don't have to spend my time trying to, to take care of the obstacles. Yeah, good. Yeah. We've had the opportunity to watch some of the meetings online. Brian's watched them faithfully and we were able to go last night and it was really a, bl a blessing. And I know the church has been blessed by the meetings. So, and I do appreciate Centerville because our church, I think, really wants to be a beacon of light in the community. And we've done that over and over. Throughout COVID, we can see how our church really stood out. I uh, was able to worship together in person and safely. So that was really good. All right. Anything else um, that's going on we need to talk about? All right. Seeing no hands, then we'll start with prayer. Father in heaven, we are grateful for this opportunity for the Sabbath day that you've given us and you've invited us to join you in resting on this day, coming to know you better on this day, understanding your word and fellowshipping together with like believers. As we've shared, our church is very special and we are grateful that Pastor Don and his team have been able to come to our church um, these last many days and present a revival message to our church, which not just us, but the world church so desperately needs. I pray that fruit will be born from these meetings, that many will be caused to come to you and have a deepening relationship with you and with your word. And now as we open your word to, to look at the Sabbath school lesson that you've brought to us this week, we ask for your Holy Spirit to bless us, to be with each one, to open your word to our hearts and our hearts to your word, I pray for Jesus' sake, amen. All right, <clears throat> well, the, um, this lesson today, don't want to disappoint anybody, but this lesson this week uh, has many facets and uh, it could actually take a couple weeks to discuss everything. So that's my, that is my hint to you that we will not cover everything in the lesson this week. There's one thing that I think that we really do need to address this week that was in the lesson and we'll come to that and you will not be surprised <laughs> I've picked up on that. But so first of all, um, I just want to remind us of our theme. The theme is on death, dying, and the future hope. So that's the theme. And the title of this lesson is the New Testament Hope. So let me start by asking you a question. What is the New Testament Hope? Anybody? Eternal life and immortality with Jesus. Absolutely. So that is the hope, <clears throat> definitely. Uh, let me ask you another question. Um, how many of you believe that Jesus Christ is coming soon? Let me see your hands. Okay, everyone is, believes that Jesus Christ is coming soon. And what do you base that belief that Jesus Christ is coming soon? His promise. His promised. 
Okay, he's promised, and he's faithful who has promised. God does not lie, so he is coming again. Yes, go ahead, Steve. The signs and current events. Okay, so he's promised, and then signs and current events. Anybody else have another idea, any other idea, how we know that Jesus Christ is indeed coming soon? Prophecy. The what? Prophecy. prophecy. Okay, so prophecy. All right. So I'm going to... I was going to say our lives are short. Our lives are short. Okay, can you expound a little bit more on that? Okay, so in, in, the, in, the, in the context of eternity, our lives are short. Okay, all right. Okay, so I'm going to come back, circle back around to that, those questions uh, for the last part of the lesson. But in the meantime, I want to go to the memory verse. However, I want you to open your Bibles because I want to cover a couple more texts that were presented in the, um, in the quarterly. So it's 1 John, the memory text is 1 John chapter 5, and they wanted us to look at verses 11 and 12, but I'd like us to look at verses 10 to 12, and then I'd actually want to discuss the memory text a little bit. So 1 John chapter 5, and it's verses 10 to 12, and it says this, he who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself he who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given his son. And this is the testimony, that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. He who has the life, he who has the son has life and he who does not have the son does not have life. Okay, so that's the text. Um, what is the text saying? If you look at these verses, what are they saying? Good Bible students, to exegete the text, what is it saying? There's only one way to have eternal life. Okay. So there's only one way to have eternal life, and that's in the Son of God. Okay, so let me just uh, break down a couple things here. Let's just look very quickly at this. So um, if you go back to verse 10, verse 10 says, He who believes in the Son of God, that's the first thing that we need to understand. And if you look at this, he who believes in the Son of God, if we go back to, keep your hand there in First John, chapter 5. If you go back to John chapter 3, verse 16, very common uh, text we're all familiar with. But I just want to look at John chapter 3. See, when, when, the, when 1 John chapter 5 says, he who believes in the Son, it's not some uh, nebulous thing that we're looking at, but we're looking at something specific that the text wants us to focus on. So 1 John chapter 3, I'll read from verse 16 to 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish. In other words, we need to believe that God indeed gave his only begotten son. If we don't believe that, we're going to be miserable. So, for God so loved the world that he gave, he didn't lend him, he gave him his only son, uh, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Then we also see God's heart towards humanity when he says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The goodness of God is revealed in this text. First of all, he loves us. God's attitude towards us, his heart towards us, is not one of enmity, but one of reaching out to us in love. Um, and in fact, that he gave his son to us. Verse 18, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So go back to verse uh, to 1 John chapter 5. So if we believe in the Son, we just read what that's all about, he has the witness in himself. Um, what is the witness 
And by the way, when we look at John chapter 3, verse 16 and on, we believe then that God has the power to save all who come to him to the uttermost. We have to believe that as well. Okay, so now what does it mean when it says, um, has the witness in himself? What does that mean? And I think you've been studying a little bit about this. It won't be necessarily intuitive, but you've been studying about this this week too. The witness in himself. What does that mean, the witness in himself? I think that we have to have a personal experience with Jesus Christ. A personal experience. Not just that we've read about it, but that we know for ourselves that Jesus Christ indeed has come to us. Um, and that personal experience is going to be very important. Now, I just want to look over at um, verse 11. And it's verse, at the end of verse 10, it talks about the testimony. And what is the testimony? The testimony is that God has given us eternal life. Now, the tense of the verb there is in the aorist tense, which is a Greek kind of a, a tense. But it means that that is a historical act, a historical event in the past, that God at a point in time, has given us eternal life, but that life is only in his son. Okay, now that's going to become important as we think about some other things later on in the lesson. Okay, so he's given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. In other words, verse 12, he who then has the son has life. He who does not have the son does not have life because Jesus Christ is the only source of life. If you don't have him, you don't have life. Okay, so this text, I think, tells us some very, the memory text tells us some very important things. Um, the one other point I wanted to make on this verse is what does it mean to have the Son? And th this, to me, is really important. What does it mean to have the Son? It means that Christ is dwelling in the heart as the superiorly honored guest. So Christ is dwelling in your heart as the most important fact. He should be the only honored guest in the heart. That's what it means. So when his Christ is in your heart, he dwells there. He lives inside of us. And that is really important. In other words, we can't have Christ and something else in our hearts. We can't be divided. So when it says, that, when the text says, he who has the Son, that means that our lives are supremely committed to God, and He's the only one that has place in our hearts, our minds, our lives. All right, does that make sense? Okay. Um, so I want to go to the material that was on um, Sunday's lesson, that text, and that text is in 1 Corinthians. I want you to go to 1 Corinthians. And it's chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And the verses that they've given us is verses 12 to 19. I'll cover verse 20. So 1 Corinthians 15, 12 to 19. Um, if you remember from, I think it was, it was last week, because we were in another church last week. Um, and... Um, the first four verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul goes over the facts of the gospel. And the facts of the gospel included the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, as he goes over the gospel, he includes the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then, from verse 5 to 8, he gives us the historical reality that indeed Jesus Christ was risen because all these people saw him. So, in that context, the, the fact of the gospel, what the gospel is, the historical nature of the resurrection. Now he goes to the issue that was facing the Corinthian people, and that's in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12 to 19. So we'll just read through this, um, and then uh, we'll, we'll discuss. So now if Christ, verse 12, now if Christ is preached that he's been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is also 
in vain. Yes, and we have found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we have all men the most pitiable. Okay, so what have we learned from this text as we've gone through these verses? What have we learned as we've gone through these verses? What is Paul trying to get through to us? Okay, so the very first thing, so if you look at the title of the lesson, the New Testament hope, the New Testament hope is that we're going to be resurrected and we will be in heaven with Jesus. So what Paul is going with is the basis of this belief that the hope of our resurrection, the foundational truth of that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if there's no resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are miserable. Okay. Any other comments on that? Yes. I think he's also saying that perspective and theology have a huge impact on the way we live our lives. Because if we if we don't have hope, we are to be pitied. Versus we have hope, therefore we can live a joyful life. Okay. I like that very much. So we live our lives based on hope. And if you don't have any hope, our lives are going to be completely miserable. Okay. Any other thoughts on this passage? Yes, go ahead. I think this points out how incredibly important the resurrection of Christ is. Because mm -hmm. Paul doesn't just say, if Christ isn't resurrected, we don't have hope. He says we're still in our sins. Yes. We have not salvation completed without the resurrection of Christ. Okay. So what we see is the whole plan of salvation, including the resurrection. And if you don't have the resurrection, we have nothing. In fact, what he says, and Joe said, is that our faith is futile. And in fact, he says, you are still in your sins. So if there's no resurrection, our faith is futile, we're still in our sins. Yes, go ahead, Jean-Paul. Uh, I think that is the important point. Why resurrection is important? Okay. Because even now, when we are in Christ, we are saved, but we live still in, in a world where there is sin. The sin is all around us. Okay. But that, when we have that resurrection, it will be the end of sin. Okay. So okay. So there's something about the resurrection that allows for the end of sin. Okay. Very good. Any other thoughts? Yes, go ahead. The resurrection was proof of the efficacy of the sacrifice. Okay. Now, I really like that. You just said that the resurrection is proof of the end of the sacrifice of Christ. No, it was the proof of the efficacy. Yes, the efficacy. Yes. Okay. Now, I'm going to find us to lead us to a text that proves that exact point right there. And I think one of the most foundational issues, everyone has mentioned things, and this issue I think is really important. So I want you to keep your hand there in 1 Corinthians, but I want you to go to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. And you have to bear with me here. Romans chapter 4. And it is verse 25. And this, this tells us, uh, this text at least tells us exactly what the gentleman in the back here said. Okay. So it says in Revelation chapter 4. Verse 25, speaking about Jesus Christ, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Now, does that text resonate with anybody? That's a really important text. So if you look at this text, that, uh, there's a little bit of an interesting thing there, but if you look at, at that word, um, he was raised up because of or on account of um, of our offenses. He was delivered up because of our offenses. Even so, he was raised up 
as kind of proof of our justification. In other words, Jesus Christ died because of our offenses. He was raised because of our justification. So that's really important. So Christ died, but he was also raised. If he had not been raised, we would have no hope of overcoming sin and getting sin out of our lives. But he was raised up. We're on vantage ground, and now we can live in newness of life. And that's how what happens as well to, of that. Now, so first we have the foundation of our hope, which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what I want to say related to the next level is that we can now respond to Christ because of his resurrection. So the first part is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now comes a response because he was, he was um, crucified because of our offenses. He's been raised up because of our justification. So the first thing is Christ has already done something for us. And now we can respond to the gift that he's given us through the cross of Christ. Okay. So I think that's a, a really a significant point there. Um, now let's go back over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I just want to read verse 20. And verse 20 says, but now gives us the, gives us the promise. Someone talked about the promise. Um, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. This is a promise. Has, the promise has two parts. It says, first of all, that he's risen from the dead. And now that's, that he has, and now he's become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. If you look at the Passover supper, the Passover supper was eaten on Nisan 14. What day, date, was Christ resurrected? Some of you might know. It was Nisan 16. So they ate the Passover. He was resurrected in Nisan 16. Guess what day in the Jewish cycle of these feasts was the feast, the feast of first fruits? It was Nisan 16. So those first fruits then is a guarantee. It's a promise. It's a pledge that God has given us that he is coming again. He's the first fruits of those who will, will come again, that he will come again, those that he will be resurrected. So I think that's a really important thing. All right. Any comments, further comments on what we've done so far? All right. Now I want to come to something that was mentioned. If you have a quarterly, I don't know how many of you have quarterlies. Um, the quarterly began to address the issue of I will come again and spoke about the delay. So this is on Monday's lesson. First of all, one of the promises is uh, Jesus Christ said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If I wouldn't sort of told you. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. That's what he said. Um, in Revelation, uh, John writes in four places, Behold, I come quickly. And then he says, Behold, I am coming quickly. Twice he said that. And then he said, Surely, I am coming quickly. Okay. So that's what the Bible says. Now let me read what the quarterly says, and we'll discuss this. I want to get your reaction, your response to what is written here in the quarterly. So many Christians have complained about the long delay. Does anybody here feel sometimes like there's a delay? We feel like there's a delay, right? So many Christians have complained about the long delay. But how do we in fact know that there is a long delay? So the author is saying, how do we know, in fact, that there is a long delay? What would have been the right time for Christ to have returned? Would it have been 50 years ago, 150 years ago, 500 years ago? What really matters? Okay, so just remember, this, if you don't have a quarter, just remember that. What really matters is the biblical promise that the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness, instead he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Does everybody agree with that? Okay. Um, and then it says, because all that we have is our own short life, followed by an unconscious rest in the grave, and then the final resurrection, 
without any later opportunity to change our destiny. As far as each one of the, of the dead is concerned, because all the dead are asleep and unconscious, the second coming of Christ is never more than a moment or, or two after they die. For you, in your personal experience, okay, Christ's return is no more than a moment after your death. That's very soon, is it not? And then there's a question at the bottom. A pastor preached a sermon arguing that he didn't care when Christ returned. All he cared about was that Christ does return. How does that logic work for you? And how might it help you, help if you are discouraged over Christ having not yet returned? Thoughts of what I just read. Yes, Ron. I think there is a delay. We're told okay. in the parable of the ten virgins, the bridegroom delayed. So there is a delay, but we can't charge God with that delay. Amen. The problem is with us. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other, any other thoughts? Yes, Adley. I think it's comforting in a way what you read, you know, when you lose a lot of blood. On the other hand, I agree with John. It takes us off the hope a little bit. And I think it makes us ignore the impact of suffering and the great controversy in the entire universe. Okay, thank you very much. Anybody else of this? Yes. I was just thinking that so many scriptures say at that just the right time, Christ did this. And I feel like at just the right time, he will come. Okay, so at just the right time, he will come. Okay, any other thoughts on that? Thank you very much for the comments. I appreciate that. Any other comments that anybody would like to make? Debbie. But he's not bound by time. In any way. We like to shrink it down to an understandable formula or outline. Okay. God is not bound by my thoughts. Okay, not by by okay, very good. Dr. Small, did you have a comment? Yes. <clears throat> yes, I I think that from a selfish perspective, he is giving me time to really accept him. If he had come at times in the past, you know, I might not have been ready. Okay. So I you know, I, I appreciate that he is wanting to give us every last moment possible to accept his grace. Okay, all right. Okay, let me just read some comments that Ellen White wrote, and I'm just going to let her speak and see what we think about what she's written. Um, this question about the delay is, is really important, I think, to the Seventh-day Adventist Church in particular. Because the Seventh-day Adventist Church was not put on this planet to be another church. I've said that before. We were to be a prophetic movement. And I think the word movement is what's really important. So I want you to consider that concept when I read these quotes because I think it helps us. Adelaide brought up an important point. What I want to say is, as people of faith, we see uh, the, the text that we read at the beginning in 1 John chapter 5, John chapter 3, verse 16, etc., give us a confidence that our salvation in Christ is done. It's a done deal. So the good news of the gospel is we don't have to sit and worry about ourselves and our own sal salvation. But the fact of the matter is, is there more to the issue of the second coming than my going to heaven? and my being saved. And Adelaide, I think, hit the nail on the head when she said, there are larger issues at stake, and those issues are the great controversy. That's really important. The most important thing, I think, in all the universe is the issues of the great controversy. And God is called witnesses. So let me just read this stuff that Ellen White has written. So she points to some of the quotes that uh, have been already been mentioned, uh, one of the texts that was already mentioned. And this she wrote, in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, in 1868. Now, all these quotes are not going to be in exact order, but in 1868, this is what she said. The long night of gloom is trying, but the morning is deferred in mercy. Because if the master should come, so many would be found unready. God's unwillingness to have his people perish has been the reason for so long delay. That was in 1868. 
The next quote I'm going to read um, is, it was in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, and that was in 1900. Now, the majority of these are the quotes she wrote after the 1888 General Conference session. And so she wrote this, and this was in Testimonies for the Church, like I said, Volume 6. Had the purpose of God been carried out by his people in giving the world the message of mercy, Christ would ere this have come to the earth and the saints would have received their welcome into the city of God. So what did she say? She said, had, this, had the uh, people of God been faithful to give his message to the world, he'd have come ere this. And that was in 1900, she said that. In 1903, in the General Conference Bulletin, March 30, she said, I know that if the people of God had preserved a living connection with him, if they had obeyed his word, they would today been in the heavenly Canaan. And that was written March 30, 1903. What date is it today? November 19, 2022. That was a long time ago she wrote that. And then in uh, Testimony for the Church, Volume 9, in 1909, she wrote this. If every watchman on the walls of Zion had given the trumpet a certain sound, the world might ere this have heard the message of warning. But work is years behind. She said that work is years behind. While, now listen to this last sentence, while men have slept, Satan has stolen a march on us. This is serious. Now, I didn't write this stuff. I like to say that it's a disclaimer. I didn't write this stuff. Ellen White did. And I believe that she's a servant of the Lord. Now, this next quote is really important. And this is, um, it's in evangelism. She has many things in, the, in evangelism. And it's beginning on page uh, 695. The angels of God in their messages to men represent time as very short. Thus, it has always been presented to me. It is true that time has continued longer than we expected in the early days of this message. And she's speaking specifically about the Seventh-day Adventist church movement as the church came into being. Thus, it has always been presented to me. Our Savior did not appear as soon as we hoped, but has the word of the Lord failed? Never. It should be remembered that the promises and the threatenings of God are alike conditional. 